right? Yeah. 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 So you were born in... Uh, yeah, I was born April 25th, 1924 in South Bend, Indiana. Oh, South Bend. And my uh, mother went down to be with her mother when she had me, uh, and my grandmother was living down there at that time. So oh. she took uh, Mary with her, who was about 16 months old, and Mary was supposed to be 16 months old. And so they went down, and I was born in my grandmother's house oh. in the South Bend. I don't know what. Were you both living in Hesperia at the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I grew up then in Hesperia, went to grade school. Mm -hmm. We lived about a block and a half away from school. Got to watch the old frame school building burn down one school morning. And it made a wonderful fire. That broke your heart. Huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> then, then they had to uh, put us in churches and church basements, and then they fixed up the school. They had a gymnasium and they put school bathrooms in the basement of that and uh, then eventually built. No, I went to school all the time in that in that gym and then they had moving chairs that they used that. What grade were you in when the fire? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I can just remember it's uh, probably third or fourth grade, Pretty something young. like that. Yeah. And uh, I always remember an eighth grade teacher. You always have one teacher you remember. I remember an eighth grade teacher, Ella Green. And don't remember it. <laughs> Probably a disciplinarian, right? Yeah, but, but uh, real tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I participated in sports. Uh, I was good in basketball. I played baseball, but not very good, and ran some track. Uh, we didn't have football at that time mm -hmm. at the school. Uh, mm -hmm. Graduated in 1942. I think there was like 24 students in that in the graduating class, so it was quite small. Uh, and uh, well, after I, I graduated in 1942, and World War II had started in 1941 in December, so I was always had been interested in airplanes and was after my father to sign the papers so I could join up, but he did not want to do that. So I went to Detroit. Uh, and my father had a couple of brothers down there, and one of them worked in a machine shop, the Excello. And so I went to work, went down and applied for a job, and went to work uh, where he was, uh, and worked on a milling machine. Hated it. Absolutely hated it, because I was used to working for my father, and I delivered tractor gas to farmers, and worked in the gas station, and run a mail route for him, and. So I was always on the go and outdoors, and then to get inside in one place. And we worked 20 days and had a day off. And that just about killed me. I hated that. Orville wasn't the Chevrolet dealer at that time. Yes, he was. Oh, he was. But he had a gas station in front of it. And uh, so it was was always active, always jumping around mm -hmm. and fun. So worked there, and then in the meanwhile, I would call him about once a week or once every two weeks to see if he was ready to sign papers yet or not, and finally convinced him that I either had to join and get what I might want or get or get drafted eventually. So uh, I think along about November of uh, 42, uh, he said he would sign it. So I came, quit the job and came home to Asbury and, and went to Muskegon and took a, an exam, I don't remember what it was, some kind of a, a small physical to see if you could move. and, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. I remember if we took a written exam or not. Uh, and they signed you up then, and then I went to work in a, another machine shop waiting to be called uh, in Muskegon, the machine shop was. And then in February of 43, uh, I got called up. Went to Detroit, hopped on a train, troop train that they had called a whole bunch of I mean, let's get a whole train load just coming out of the Michigan area in Ohio and Indiana. And I went to Miami, Florida, Miami Beach, rather. Stayed in the hotel, only they didn't have room service then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, 
went through basic training, learning how to salute and what, how the Army worked, because it was the Army Air Corps then, and uh, took basic training. Then they gave us a test one day. We went to one of the theaters, and they gave us a test. It took about three hours long, and it was a written test. Uh, of course, I think I'm real smart just coming, graduating from high school, and I never knew that I didn't know so much. Uh, and it was very extensive. Uh, and then they graded you on that and then selected you because they were starting a, a college training detachment, they called them. And they sent the prospective air crew members around to various colleges and then they went through school. So I went to uh, Berry College, which was in Rome, Georgia. Uh, so we transferred up there after a couple of months. Uh, of basic training, and uh, uh, went through uh, school. I was there, I think, two months. And I was, for some reason or other, I went through the advanced class. We went, for instance, we went through spherical trigonometry in one day, and that's how much they pushed your, you know, just threw it at you. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was interesting, though. Know, with your, and the food was excellent. Uh, they had dining rooms and served as family style, so we appreciated that a great deal. Um, was there for a couple of months. Then they sent us to pre-flight, uh, which was in Nashville, Tennessee, and they uh, took you took exam physical and mental and texting, uh, checking your dexterity and all kinds of examinations and spent about a month there. Uh, then they sent us to Maxwell Field in Alabama uh, where you were, I think, was there for two months. Uh, and that was just marching and uh, ground school uh, and physical training, uh, getting used to being in a regimented situation. After it completed two months there, then they sent us to a, a primary flying school, which was a, a private flying school uh, in Camden, South Carolina. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, they taught you in a Spearman with a 225 air cooled uh, Continental engine, uh, open cockpit, uh, biplane. And so it was stressed for acrobatics. And they give you dual instructions until you solo, and I soloed at 10 hours of dual instruction. Um, they were specifically designed, I think, to ground loop, which means that <laughs> when you <laughs> come in and landed, well, you made sure that you were going in a straight line, or otherwise they'd spin around in a circle with you. And uh, so that was, and they had an inertia starter where you cranked a handle. The people that weren't flying, you were on the flight line waiting for your turn to fly, while well, you had to start the engines and get up and crank that thing, and <laughs> get the inertia going, and then the pilot or yeah, then it would engage. They'd have a lever inside to engage the engine. It would roll over. And that was a radial engine. Right? Correct, radial. Yeah. Uh, I d I never did fly an inline aircraft engine. It was a, I always flew radials. I think T51s and were about um, some British planes were about the only ones that had uh, inline engines. Otherwise, they were all radials. Uh, that uh, was a PT. Uh, a horizontal. I don't, I'm not sure what that one had. Uh, I've flown one. Well, Spearman, the new plane, though. I yeah, they very sturdy, especially for training, because they some some of your landings would have a maybe 25 bounces on them before you'd finally get it down. They were kind of prone to ground looping. Though. Yeah, <laughs> I think they built that in to get you used to if you ever got into fighters. They have a narrow landing mm -hmm. uh, span or the. Span on the landing gear, Carol. So, 
you're liable to flip one of those around too if you don't keep it straight. So. Uh, they gave us 60 hours. We got 60 hours of flying time in, in primary, which was two, uh, two months. And part of it was dual, I don't remember. And, but they got you into acrobatics. And, uh, they'd send you out solo and you'd go out and practice your stalls and turns and, and the acrobatics. And I had a, went out in this one area uh, and there was a, a little store up nowhere in South Carolina, probably 25 miles from the base and, and would go out and, and I didn't even notice it. One day I was flying out there and I noticed this storekeeper sitting out in front of his store with a, in his chair. And so when I go out in there again, why well, I just burp the motor a couple of times and he'd bring his chair out and sit and watch me. So I had <laughs> spectated. I think he did a little better practicing because there was somebody there. It was, what, it was doing some aerobatics? Yeah, yeah, you know, spins and, mm -hmm. and slow rolls and loops and snap rolls and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it was kind of funny to see this guy get his chair and come out and watch the <laughs> amateur air show. Uh, so after two months, I uh, left there and then went to uh, Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina and went into basic training and you flew a 450 horsepower fixed landing gear, uh, but it had a two-speed prop on it and uh, uh, what I thought it had an enclosed canopy so you could shut the weather out. And was this the T6 then? No, it was the BT-13. Oh, BT-13? 13 or 15. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think they called them a Volte vibrator. Yeah. Volte yeah. made that. Some of the other guys that flew that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you might have been good. Uh, about <laughs> halfway, <laughs> about half, and you got about 60 hours in each two month segment that you were in. But about halfway through that way they were changing their program so to get you into heavier things and uh, they uh, uh, put us into AT-10, which was a, a little twin-engine job that took a pilot and a co-pilot. Then when we got into advanced training, the next segment, we were to get B-25. Uh, however, when we got to advanced, they didn't have enough B-25s, so I flew that AT-10 all through advanced, too. Then. My first cross-country was on a BT-13, and I was a uh, three-legged job and you went out and you landed at a coast at the coast of the Atlantic Ocean at George mm -hmm. I won't say because I can't remember the name of the town now. Anyway, I was right on the coast <coughs> of South Carolina in the Atlantic Ocean and you checked in and then you flew to another leg to another base down further south and then landed and checked in and then come back to your home base. Well, I never found a second base. I lost that one somewhere so long. I got lost. Had to, you went down, followed the railroad track till you come to a town, then you went down low enough to read the name on the front of the railroad track station. <laughs> and uh, so you then looked on the map to see where you were and then plotted your course for home. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that by getting lost the first time uh, they decided that I should go into heavy bombers where <laughs> I had a navigator. <laughs> I don't know if that was the criteria, but I'm sure that helped. Yeah. Uh, so then I uh, graduated from there in two months and went to Albany, Georgia, down in the southern part of Georgia. Went to advanced uh, flying school and again flew AT-10. Some of the good pilots, the real ex-pilots, which I was not one of them, got into B-25. And so the, the, that was the ultimate in advanced flying was mm -hmm. to get into a B-25 or something. Mm -hmm. Just a little more powerful, made more noise. This AT-10, uh, remember who manufactured No, we there? called it the Bamboo Bomber. All oh, some of the other guys. Yeah. Back to that, yeah. Were they a lot of made of wood? Yeah, fabric. Uh -huh. and fabric? Yeah. And I don't remember the size was, of the engine. It but was a twin engine. Twin engine, I can't. Remember if it had a retractable gear or not, uh, but it had uh, radial engines, radial engines mm -hmm. and a uh, multi constant pitch prope propeller, so that you could maintain an RPM mm 
on us. Um, and you flew with a, uh, with another student then, or the instructor pilot. Uh, I remember the last, <coughs> the last, uh, well, you, we got, had different parts of the training, but part of it was learning how to fly night formation, which was a, a very confusing. Kind of scary, yeah. Yeah. And they had you um, landing with landing lights and runway lights, and then they'd shut the runway lights off and have you land with just landing lights. And mm -hmm. so you'd be used to those problems that you ran into along the way. But uh, I had a, uh, a fellow that I was the last night flying co-pilot for, and you'd go up and fly for a while, and then you'd switch seats and uh, come back down and land, and then switch seats, and then you'd fl he'd fly for a while, and you'd be a co-pilot. And uh, I can't remember his first name, but he was a big, tall young man. His last name was Greenberg. And so we're flying. The, the hardest time getting into night formation is getting into the formation because you have to figure out which direction the lead plane's going in and where he's at and, and get in and, and tuck yourself in behind his wing and, and know where he is. Well, anyway, uh, the instructor pilot took off, and Greenberg and I took off, and, and we get up, and he gets about a quarter of a mile away or so, and, and the instructor says, Greenberg, get in here closer. Greenberg says to me, not on the radio, I'm not getting any closer. I'm graduating tomorrow. I'm getting my wing tomorrow. I'm not getting any closer. <laughs> Greenberg, get that plane in here closer. <laughs> we never did get in closer. And they didn't, uh, and he graduated the next day too. I don't know what he ended up doing because I had a lot of track to him. I have, uh, all through training, they did it a great deal of segmenting you out into, uh, uh, by alphabet. When I was in Rome, Georgia, that college training detachment, they were all H's. Everybody's name started with H. Exactly. Uh, in basic and primary school, uh, we had mostly H's. Uh, so consequently, my best friend is named Hutchinson, and his serial number is one less than mine. When we graduated, they gave you a, a commissioned you as a second lieutenant, and then uh, gave you a different serial number then. And uh, I was, I'd know him, and I'd still visit with him. And he says, you're the only one that knows how to get into my computer because he uses his old serial number to, <laughs> for his code to get in and it's one number different than mine. Right, so. Yeah, and you always remember those numbers yeah, too. Uh, I still remember mine. Yeah, you well, you repeat it so many times yeah. that it gets firmly ingrained in your mind. Right. Zero eight two three five nine five. Graduated from flying school in February of 1944, which they go by each month as a letter, so I was in the class of 44B. Is that when you got your wings? And your wings and commission. commission. Yeah. And a uniform allowance, so you bought your uniform. Went on, uh, uh, what they call it, a delay in route, and so I got about 15 days at home and was transferred from Albany, Georgia, then to uh, north of St. Petersburg plant city or something they called it. It was just a depot where they had everybody come in and then they assigned them to crews. Uh, and so I went there and then got transferred to McDill in Tampa, Florida, which was a B-17 training school. I was put with a crew and the, as a co-pilot and the pilot had already gone to B-17 transition school, which is just training to learn how to be fly B-17. And so we did training there where the gunners shot in the water and and you flew formation and you went on cross-country trips and just... In a B-17? Yes, in a B-17. Um, I had uh, Dick Leisher was the pilot, I was the co-pilot, uh, Bob Severo was the bombardier and Louis Long was the navigator. And uh, we were a good efficient crew. We won crew of the month and got your picture taken and all that publicity to get your, you know, build your ego up a little bit. Was there a couple of months, uh, which 
March, April, May, something like that when we got through training in that area. Uh, they put us on a train, sent us to Savannah, Georgia. Uh, stayed there for three or four days and uh, made another train up and then went to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. Uh, we were there for while well, they were making up a convoy and they put us on the troop ship and it took us 21 days to go across the North Atlantic in a convoy on a troop ship. Yeah. 21 days? Yeah. Uh, and they went slow. It was the slowest ship and, and wandered around. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't know the ocean was quite that big. It was very rough. Uh, enormous waves. No seasick? No. Because flying and and uh, motion uh, on the sea is about the same. I don't think anybody on the hmm. uh, on the boat got sick. I'm sure some yeah, of the other stack like cordwood though down, oh, down yeah, below. Oh yeah, yeah. I can see how they could lose if you ever got torpedoed or anything. Or you'd, you'd never, you'd never get out of there. Now. You'd walk in this little state room or little room, and there would be like uh, there were four bunks high on the floor, and and that would reach up about to the top of your head to four bunks. And so they would They're close together. Yeah, so they'd have sixteen people in that, you know, four and four or eight and then four on the other side and then they would you'd have to interrupt the card game every time you wanted to get up and leave. <laughs> they'd have be sitting in the middle of the bottom bunk to have a card game. Yeah. Uh, got went into Liverpool, England and then they sent us to a, uh, a depot, again, of people till they assigned you to a group. And then they sent us from there. Uh, so I ended up in the 8th Air Force in the 3rd Division. They had three divisions in the 8th Air Force. Uh, first division was B-17s, the second division was B-24s, and the third division was B-17. Uh, my friend Hutchinson ended up and a base north of me in B-24s. So I eventually made contact with him. When he was over there through his wife, I would write to her and then she'd write back and telling me where, where he was. Uh, went into a, uh, it was a third division, then it was the 385th Bomb Group and the 550th Squadron. Mm -hmm. The people that we replaced or the crew that we replaced uh, was had landed in Switzerland on a mission down in southern France someplace, and they we always kidded about we didn't really know if they knew what they were doing or not, but they took their dress uniforms <laughs> with them when they went on that mission and anticipating any kind of suspicious. Yeah, it's kind of you don't usually take your dress uniform along when you go on a combat mission. Uh, and we, uh, then they give you some more training. Uh, you spend half your life in the service training, I think, uh, to get used to their way of flying formation and what, and where the base was. Uh, you had trouble in England finding your base because there were so many B-17 landing fields around there that they kind of, your patterns almost intermingled. Uh, so you had definite, uh, physical description in your mind of the, of your base so you wouldn't land land at the wrong one because there was a lot of them would land at the wrong one. Yeah. Um, what was the town you were uh, in? Do you remember? No, it was just a little tiny burg on the railroad station that had a, lots of beautiful train service over there. Did you live in a Quonset hut or uh, what kind of housing? No, kind of a square. No, I guess it was Quonset, <coughs> that particular. Some of them were just square buildings. And um, with just a long building with a coal stove in the middle. Uh, and that was to be, and, and I got in there in about the middle of June. It was sometime after D Day that, that we got in to be operational. The first mission they sent you out, and I flew as a co pilot with another crew that had already flown 25 missions. They, want, and they did that with the whole crew. They put one person from that crew on a plane and because they found out they lost a lot of crews if they went as a unit mm -hmm. on their first mission from confusion and mm -hmm. excitement and so on. Mm -hmm. So they spread them out. Uh, one of the other
other H's, uh, a boy by the name of Hubbard, was had gone through training with me all the way, and he was in the same squadron. And in fact, he was in the same barracks that I was. Uh, he was a co-pilot on, on another crew. So you kind of, you have people that you're with all the time, and yet you have people that you're not with all the time. I mean, they, they disappear along the way, but some of them you're with all the time. Uh, the, some of the missions that we went on were quite memorable and others were just kind of routine and you wouldn't have any problems. If you were going to have a problem, it seemed like they all waited to gang up with you on one, one mission or so. And, uh, uh, we, the first time the crew went into Berlin, which was about the fifth mission, and we were flying in the formation then, because we were brand new, was down in the low squadron in the tail end Charlie, which is not a ideal position to be in, but they, when you go on a bomb run, you fly in and you have an initial point uh, close to your target where you uh, start your bomb run, and it's a physical location on the ground, so usually quite predominant so that you can find it and make that turn and then you have a heading and that's where the bombardier picks up his target and puts it in the bomb site and starts, he starts flying the plane then as far as direction is concerned and you fly the altitude and the speed and he takes care of the direction left or right and he steers the plane through the automatic pilot with the bomb site. And uh, so we turned on the initial point and started into the target and just as we got over the target way another the group ahead of us had overshot their initial point and went down further then turned and came back and we had about 30 airplanes all coming over the target at the same time with the bomb bay doors open and everybody went hell west and crooked just <laughs> scattered uh, anyway we ended up different levels too apparently yeah? Well, they're just, all pretty much at the same they're all, you bombed at the same altitude all the time, mm -hmm. or not all the time, but I mean at that particular, they gave you a bombing altitude when you, before the mission started. I see. So they were, they were all going like this, mingling into one another. And so, but no, no collisions, everybody was able to maneuver out of the way, but, uh, uh, and of course everybody's got their bomb bay doors open, ready to drop. And, uh, so, anyway, we ended up as, uh, as in number two position on the lead plane when we got back in formation because everybody just came back into formation and dropped the bombs in the meantime. I'm sure they didn't hit the target that day. <laughs> <laughs> in the wrong place. Um, when you went into Germany, you went, uh, if you bombed in the northern part where you'd go in over the North Sea and then turn and go in in the Hamburg area and there's a island out there called Heligoland and you never went by that thing that they didn't shoot at you. And uh, I would catch the gunners on the plane every once in a while, and you're at 25,000 feet, which is five miles, shooting their machine guns at Heligoland <laughs> just for retaliation to, to get rid of some anxieties or whatever. And, uh, uh, so it was like kind of interesting to go by that little island out there. They must have with a dozen or so flat guns out there, but they'd shoot. they couldn't reach you either because you didn't get that close. Mm -hmm. But if you happened to stray over there, why well, they would, uh, oh. it would take a pop at you. Uh, we uh, had some strange problems. Uh, one time we were out and we got a, some slack and it went up and hit the casting that hooks onto the rudder that controls the rudder and bent it so that it, where the shrapnel went up to the bottom of it and bent it up and it, so we didn't have a rudder then. So you don't really need a rudder to fly. You can fly the airplane and tip and turn with the wings, except when you go to land, the wings lose their directional control. The ailerons don't work anymore when you're stalling out and you need the rudder to, for direction. So. I think you jump back just a little bit. When you go out on the mission, they give you an escape kit. 
which has a silk map in it, and I forget what all it had in. But one of the contents was a small uh, hacksaw blade, I guess for cutting the bars on the prison or something that they get, I don't know, kind of foolish. But anyway, we had this, they had this hacksaw blade. So uh, I was leading the high squadron then by that time. And uh, so the tail gunner come out of his position and the ball tail gunner come up. And they sat back in the tail and worked for about an hour with their handheld hacksaw blades and cut that piece off that was jutting up in the air so we could have a rudder when we landed. So it's always some entertainment of some type going along the line. Um, I flew co-pilot for about, I think around 15 missions. Then they made the pilot operations officer and the squadron and he flew as command pilot then after that, which would just be occasionally. And so I got the crew then, and the rest of the crew then, and they, so, and then forever after that, I would just have whatever co-pilot happened to be around, they'd assign you one for that day, so I never had one that was permanent. Uh, the rest of your crew was all pretty They all stayed right? the same, unless somebody would be sick or something like that. When we got through, uh, got through, you had to fly 35 missions then. I think I was the only one out of the crew that flew the whole 35, but then some of them that were, had been sick today or something like that, it would uh, uh, not, they just, when, they, when I flew my 35, well, then everybody went home at the same time. So. Did you uh, pretty much have the same equipment or did you? Well, yeah, we had one airplane all the time. Uh, we got assigned to one, which was, a, airplanes are, like cars, you can take them same color, same model, same engine, everything, and they all drive a little different. But airplanes are even more, a little more specific. They fly a little different, and their controls work all fundamentally the same, but they all have a little different feel to them. The plane we had was just a, a beautiful trimmed airplane. It would fly straight and level. Hmm. You could trim it up, so it was just, it was a nice, smooth airplane. We loved it. Uh, it was called Rio Tinto and it was named by the crew chief that was there, and he was out of New Mexico someplace, I forget what town. Uh, there aren't too many towns in New Mexico, but I don't remember what it was now. Had a little nose art on it, did it? Yeah, not very much. <coughs> uh, not like some of them. Uh, well, I had one later on after we cracked up Rio Tinto and left that in Belgium, but. Uh, it was called Rumdum, and it was an old airplane that had, they'd had mechanically they kept it up so it was a real stable, dependable airplane. But uh, it was it was real tender was didn't have any paint on it. It was just aluminum. Oh really? And uh, the first ones that went over had camouflage on them, and they were green and various colors. And yeah. that one was blue yeah. on the bottom. Or yeah. Blue? Different. Yeah, and uh, Rum Dum was that color. It was painted uh, GI green or whatever you want to call it. Call it. And, uh, it was. Uh, it had lots of bombing missions on it, but it had never gotten banged up very much. But uh, what getting was this deal in Belgium. Oh, uh, um, well, we were going in to Merseburg. The Germans had a synthetic oil factory, and they uh, it was on a bend in the river, and it was down in a real heavily fortified with flak guns. That really everybody, when they'd have the briefing in the morning, and they'd draw back the curtains, and they'd have this red line going into your route in and where it was going, and all that. Everybody ooh and oh, and when it was oh going God. into that area, yeah, and I. I think I went in there about three or four times. Uh, they were forever bombing the thing. Uh, they were just starting to do Pathfinder work then where they were bombing with radar because there was a lot of bad weather over there and it was this was getting along in the fall around Thanksgiving time in 44. And the weather would get bad and then they couldn't see the target, which was all visual bombing of the bomb site. And they were, they were, they were playing around with uh, bombing on radar could see the, on the radar screen what was down there, and so they loved this place with the, 
with the bend in the river and so on and so on. But anyway, we were, I don't know, we were probably about 20 minutes away from the target when I lost, uh, let's see, I lost number one engine first. And it was just an internal failure. The oil pressure dropped off on it. And so we feathered it and used Genet. We were flying probably, most of our missions were 21 to 24, 25,000 feet. And at that altitude, you can't stay in formation with an engine out or the bomb loads and all your other stuff that you're carrying, ammunition and guns and so on. So we uh, uh, dropped out of the formation and dropped back and kept getting further and further back. And, and uh, I was concerned about losing another engine because you have to start putting a little more uh, manifold pressure on the other three to keep flying. So uh, we decided that, or I decided that we would just drop the bombs and, and then they were going in and then making a right turn, I think, at the target and then coming back out. And you could see them over to the right of us, the other groups coming back out again. So we dropped the bomb, got across and picked up with another group coming back out and uh, flew along with them for a while and then lost number two engine. And so we're down to two engines now, and they really are laboring away, and we're... Both on the same... Yeah, one and two. Uh, B-17 has a fuel tank for each engine, and but it's through the, in the... They have a manifold situation where in between, in the center of the plane, they have a pump. So if you want to go from number one engine to number two engine with fuel, while well, you'd have to pump it over to across the center to number three, and then change the valve, and then go back to number two, from three to two. Well, <coughs> uh, the engineer, I told him to get some fuel over out of one and two, I made over three and four, and he couldn't get the pump to work. And then they have a backup system, which is just a wobble pump, or the, a pump with a handle on it, that goes across the center, and that wouldn't work. So, and when you're running on uh, just two engines, well, you're really consuming your fuel on those two engines, because you got them, the manifold pressure up real high, and so it's really sucking up the fuel. So. We were over Germany yet, and so we set a course, because we're out of that formation, now two flying by ourselves. And uh, we uh, were headed to back across, so we could get across the lines, and that was in November of 44. And so they, the American forces were up into the Belgian, and the Belgian then about halfway through, I think, or something. So. We were headed towards a town called Liège in Belgium, where we ended up at. And we kept flying until we got back across the lines. And you kept gradually going down all the time because you couldn't hold your altitude. And, and uh, the navigator and bombardier were down in the nose trying to find a field for me to land at an air base of some kind. After we got across, it wasn't too far across the lines when we got into an emergency where it was getting too low on fuel that it was about to quit. So uh, we had to make some decisions. So I told the, the crew the, to, I was not going to bail out. I was going to go down with it if the motor did quit. And they have an emergency procedure. They all get in the radio room uh, up against the bulkhead and from the tail gunner and the ball tail gunner and the waste gunners and the radio man. Uh, and the engineer and then the navigator and bombardier go back there also through the bomb bay. And uh, so I told them I was not going down there, but I would ring the bell and if they wanted to bail out, why they could. And I had a, or had a co-pilot that day that was on his last mission. That was his 35th mission going home. So he was kind of nervous anyway. And on a 17, you don't wear a seat chute, you wear a harness with snaps on the front. And then the chute pack is you stick underneath your seat. And uh, 
so we're at like 5,000 feet, and I'm still looking for a place to land. And when uh, fuel pressure gauges start flipping, it means that it's running out of fuel, and they're about to quit. And he was down in the hatch with his shoes snapped on and looking at me ready, because there's a hatch right down below you, to go out of. And I laughed at him. I didn't know he could move that fast. And, and he says, you're not going to go down. And I said, no, I'm going to stay on the plane. So he unsnapped his shoes and climbed back in the seat again. And he just picked out a spot where we, where I figured I could get into. It was a, some green fields down there. It was November, but I think it was like winter wheat, and it was up a couple inches high, so it looked nice and green, but there was a lot of mining around in that area, and they had big slag piles, you know, three or 400 feet high. And, uh, but they keep, when you go through training where they're after you all the time, your instructor pilot will cut the engine on you, and you might be in, in a loop or something like that, and you'll cut the engine, and you have to find a place to land. So they kind of train you uh, to do that. Uh, so I picked out a field that I could get into. Well, then I think the heater on a 17 is off the number two engine, whatever it was. So we didn't have a heater in the cockpit. So the windshield, when we come down in so fast, so then the windshield froze up. And the only reason you get through something like this is, is part skill and probably 30% and the other 70% is luck is all. But uh, so I remember we had uh, uh, tinted, not goggles, but it was a shield that you wore over, you could wear over your eyes, a uh, big type of goggle that come all the way around. Because uh, I tried to stick my head out the window to see where we were going, and that blew off. And, and uh, so I was flying out of my window and the co-pilot's window, seeing where you're going, and to get a judgment from altitude. Anyway, we hit on the got down and I had to slap his hand to keep him from putting the wheels down. He kept wanting to put the wheels down all the time and I did not want the wheels down. I was not concerned about the airplane. I was concerned about everybody that was in it. So we uh, got about halfway down this field I was aiming at and hit the ground and it was, it was hilly, which is kind of hard to tell uh, when you're coming in. And so we hit kind of on the top of the hill and it was skidding down this hill and it just it seemed like it went faster when I hit the ground because it was all mud underneath. It had been raining and snowing and so on. And uh, uh, so we were sliding away down through there and there was a, uh, a suburban railroad track off to the left of me that was up in the air about six, eight feet on a build up on a bank like they have railroad tracks so they stay fairly level. And we kept sliding and sliding going and I thought, you don't fool around we're going to hit that thing and we're sitting right up here in the nose if we do hit it. So 17 has an enormous tail on it compared to the rest of the thing, so rest of the fuselage. So uh, after we had skidded, it seemed like for a mile, but I'm sure it wasn't that far away, I put in full right rudder and it started to turn. It was enough to help it turn. And so then we started skidding kind of sideways and it bounced a few times and jumped up and down and then stopped. And uh, of course we wiped out the ball turret. That was gone and all four motor mounts, the motors were hanging down. And uh, uh, the <laughs> oh yeah, they're all crooked and bent around underneath that. But then uh, nobody got hurt or anything and, and everybody popped out of the plane, went out the back door in the waist. Um, Got out of the plane, we were all standing around, and a whole bunch of farmers come running from every which way because it was they were out working in the fields or doing something. I don't know where they came from, but and that time the Germans were using buzz bombs, uh, which was a, a bomb with a, a little jet engine on top of it that had a peculiar sound. That they called them buzz bombs. But we'd seen them in England and had them up by the base, and you'd hear them. And they uh, when they came in over England, boy, they would come till they run out of fuel and then they come down and explode. So that's what we were used to and so we're standing with the farmers trying to congratulating ourselves that we're down level and everything and all of a sudden they holler robo robo and they all went running which ways and, and we saw it coming and it was up in the air about a thousand feet so it's fine. No problem whatsoever and 
but there they had a mechanism on the elevators on it, so when it got up, when it got to a certain point where the elevators would come up and down it would come, well anyway, the bugger started down on it and everybody ran and it hit close enough to throw a bunch of dirt on the airplane. Is so that right? I don't, I'm sure they weren't that accurate with those things, they just happened to be there at that time. Hmm. So, uh, I don't know where, somebody sent some trucks out and picked us up and, and don't remember too much about that. The whole crew stayed in the plane though? Nobody yeah, nobody bailed out or anything. Out. Yeah. That chute is rather small when you look at it, I mean, I'm sure it does its work, but it wasn't something that I really wanted to... As you say, luck was with you on that. Yeah, yeah. But Still. Yeah, yeah, but not all skills. Some of you just have to pick the right spot because you kept being mistaken and you sure can't go around and try again. That yeah, windshield was fogging up and was oh, a yeah. terrible yeah. Just thing to happen. You're just busy, busy, busy. You know, and that's the reason they have young people flying those things is because they uh, can come up with all the innovations that they have to do. To so that was the end of... Uh, that was the end of Rio Tinto. I never saw <laughs> that one again. <laughs> we left it there. Uh -huh. and, uh, How'd you get back to England? Well, we took a truck uh, into Liège and stayed there all night, and I can't remember, I think we slept in some church or something that night, and then then they took us into France the next day on a truck, and then we flew a DC-3 from back into the base then in England, and uh, uh, it was... The rest of your gang were glad to see you. Yeah, uh, yeah, especially the the, well, the operations officer because he was our pilot to start with, and it was he knew everybody real well on the plane. And of course, they don't have any communications back to the base until you get you get back in England to know where you are because there's too many other important things going on. Were your uh, ground support people, your uh, mechanics, you probably got pretty? Did you have pretty much the same? All the time, yeah, he had the, the crew chief. There was one crew chief on an airplane, and he had uh, his name was Peterson, and uh, his chief assistant was Doobie, and then he had another one, but I can't remember the other I one. I got pretty close to those guys. Yeah, too. they were your lifeline. I mean, mm -hmm. he kept the thing running and uh, did all the repairs, and they they would start them up in the morning and, and pre flight them before you got to the on a mission, and then you would. Then you check the airplane over itself, and then my one of my biggest fears was they they had you dispersed at the airbase, so you were on uh, had a perimeter track going all the way around the to hit all the runways, but then you were off of uh, hard stands, which were uh, I think they were cement, if I remember right, uh, and then we were under revetment so that you if somebody came and bombed, what they would get all the airplanes and uh, but the perimeter track going around was kind of narrow well at 17 you steer with the motors and the brakes you don't have a the newer airplanes have a little wheel that you steer with so that you don't but anyway and they have a they don't have a tricycle gear either they have a conventional three-point which Hail makes them, gear, huh? yeah which makes them kind of strange and I was always afraid of running off the damn perimeter track and, and mud. messing up the whole mission because they yeah. have an awful time towing you out of there because it was mud. When you uh, started on a uh, mission, did you start sometimes so early in the morning that it was dark? Oh, it would be dark. And when I got in the fall, it was dark. So then you were... Um, okay, when you... they You had certain times, times to start the engine. They'd usually shoot a flare up anyway when it's time to start engines and start the engines up and then you had a time to start taxiing and you went out on a rotation uh, so that by the rotation that you went into formation and you'd go down to the end of the runway all lined up and then I think we used to take off at 30 second intervals and you take off one at a time uh, uh, and then the lead ship would take off first and he would go up and fly on a at a radio location, they call them bunchers, and fly on a racetrack pattern. Just around the circle. Yeah, only kind of have long legs on it, like a racetrack. Oh, I see. And that way you could come up and and get into formation. You could cut across the racetrack pattern and and catch up with him and uh, get into formation then. Mm -hmm. 
so in the fall while you were getting the formation it was still dark then. Uh, accidents happen. But yeah, I saw a couple 17s come together and explode up there that in nighttime and that kind of uh, makes you a little bit leery and they've got you separated out but you got a couple thousand airplanes up there flying around and so there's you do get full after a while uh, and then the same way with uh, coming back in that you fly over a radio location if it's if it's visual you go right to the base otherwise if there's cloud cover then you come to the radio location and then you fly the racetrack and you peel off one at a time and head for the base and you go down through the clouds and you fly exactly indicated 150 and 500 feet a minute descent and you hope the guy in front of you is doing that and you hope the guy behind you is doing that because you close the gap pretty close then I think we peeled off in about a minute interval uh, when we go down through the cloud cover and in the fall it gets pretty cloudy and over there so it would seem kind of good sometimes to go up and fly in the sun, but then it always was kind of gloomy when you came back, came back and you sometimes you hated to come back down through it. Uh, Did you have any ground control approach uh, no. signals or anything to no. bring in? No, they, they were just starting to put uh, a landing instrument, and I forget what they called it at the time now, but it had the two, uh, it had the horizontal elevation and the verticals and they were just starting to install that uh, but they didn't have it operational yet so we had the instruments in the airplane but they didn't have it at the base yet so, uh, one, we got in trouble a couple times and I don't remember if it was the first one or the second one time that we came back in a transport plane and I told you that we had trouble finding your base so ours had a our base had a, a big J letter formation of trees that you could see and then right in it was a three runway field right in the middle of the three runways with three trees three big trees sticking up we come back this one time with this transport plane that we were coming back and you could see the letter J and you could see the three trees but the rest of it was all fog so we uh, the pilot that was flying us back started looking for another base and we ended up at the last place in England on Land's End, landing, okay. so we almost got trouble just coming back even. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Is this after the Belgian deal? Yeah, I think it was after the next one that we had a problem on. Well, tell on me about Christmas that one. <laughs> That was uh, the day before Christmas, and they'd been having a lot of trouble with the Germans at the B Battle of the Bulge, and they couldn't get any air cover because it was, the weather was so bad. And that particular day, they put up every B-17 they could find to fly and sent them out to, to distract the Germans. We were bombing airfields because the Germans had saved some of their fighters and was putting them up and coming in uh, also. Uh, there was a man by the name of Castle that came over with the original B-17s and flew command pilot and he came over as a captain and had gone up to Colonel and and that particular day he was leading the 8th Air Force and they sent him a message that when he was out flying around the mission that he'd gotten promoted to general that day and Germans came up and shot him down and killed him that day so he, but he'd been there for about three years I think yeah. so uh, but anyway uh, we were going into some airfields quite close into Germany uh, that they were Germans were using for supporting that Battle of the Balls because they threw kind of their last last ditch effort uh, to do really something as far as offensive is concerned. And uh, they were real active that day. Uh, the ball turret gunner on our plane got credit for a ME 109 that day. We didn't see a lot of fighters. But I was going to ask you if you saw very many fighters. Yeah, it was mostly flak was our biggest one. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, he got a 109 that day, and we were bombing airfields, and I had rum dumb that day because we got rid of real tent on, on this other airplane, and I was one of the older crew members, oldest crew then, and so they give us this old airplane because they were trying to 
preserve it, I guess, or something, or keep it going as long as they could. And so we come in over the target and drop the bombs, and just, I don't know how, just a few seconds after we dropped the bombs, there was a big explosion underneath us, and I don't know what happened. But uh, being an old airplane, all I remember is all the dust that flew off from behind the instrument panel when the bomb went off, or whatever, the bombs went off, or a rocket hit them, uh, or something. But anyway, we had a hell of an explosion, my, and I was leaking high again that day, and the left wingman lost his number uh, four engine, and the right wingman lost his number one engine, and I lost number three right away. And uh, this was the day before Christmas, uh, and I had saved all my Christmas presents to open on Christmas Day. They're all in my footlocker. I'm worried about those things. But, uh, and I lost number three engine right away. The oil pressure dropped off and knocked a hole in oil reservoir or something. Anyway, the oil pressure knocked off. So I feathered that because, again, I got a strange co pilot and you have to reach all the way across because the feathering buttons are over on, my, on the right hand seat. And so feather number three. And uh, so I said, oh, the crew should check in. I mean, to, you check in the crew to find out if anybody's hurt or anything or what's going on. And they all checked in, and the radio operator said he had a fire back in his compartment. Well, the dinghy, so when your ditch is up above the radio compartment in a, compar in a hole that's accessible from the outside. So I told him, I said, well, if you got a fire in there, why? Uh, pull the lever and, and jettison that thing, get rid of it. So he did, and about 30 seconds later, where the tail gunner calls and he says, that dinghy's stuck back here on the tail. Well, some of the control surfaces on the 17 are fabric, so you don't be wanting any fires back there on the rudder. And so anyway, we maneuvered the plane around a little bit and kind of kicked that a little bit and got that off. And uh, so, so far all we had was one engine out and a fire and, and we would gotten a killed one fighter down on the way in. So things were pretty hectic around there. Well, before we started that day, why, it, the, it was kind of frosty in England and they have had some uh, liquid that they called kill frost, which I suppose was, had a lot of alcohol that they used to put on the wing. And, get rid of the frost so you wouldn't be forming ice when you were taking off and distort the lift on the wing. Well, anyway, my engineer was up doing that and he fell off the wing and hurt his shoulder. So they gave me a, a in, different engineer that day. Another one came out and got on. And uh, so he was, he runs the top turret gun and is right behind you. So we go along a little further and we were out of formation by that time because we couldn't keep up. And uh, number four engine is leaking oil. And I waited and waited because I had too much experience running on two engines from November. So I waited and I waited too long. And when I went to feather it, why that's the same oil as in the engine that feathers the prop that turns the prop into the wind. So you couldn't feather it. Now, so it runs away, which means that it just starts spinning out there like mad. Then it froze up, all the insides of the engine it froze up and uh, with no lubrication. Oh, well. I thought the wing was going to fall off when it when it finally stopped up. Well, anyway, so we've got one one engine feathered and on one side, and the other engine has uh, got its blades going with a kind of a lot of drag out there. And uh, so I we were down fairly, well, we were we were flying back in a westerly direction, so we got back across the lines, and I wanted to fly as far as I could, so I told them, I said, well, let's dump everything out of here that you can't, it was not nailed down, including all the guns and everything. Never even thought, but the, right down below the pilot, the co-pilot in the compartment, in the slot that goes up into the bombardier and navigator is a hat. Well, I figured they'd just unloosen the hatch or turn the handle and open it and shove the guns and ammunition and stuff out there from that, all that nose area, the 
So anyway, the engineer just jettisoned it, and all the wind blew up through there, and the maps and dust and dirt. Well, the poor, I just about had it then, and I apologized to that engineer afterwards, but I really worked him over for a while. He got all my venom and wrath right there for a little while. Because you could only kind of get, get to a limit after a while. And uh, so we flew on back and and got and then headed north back towards England. And But I could see we weren't, my fuel was kept going down and that we weren't going to make it. So we looked, started looking for airfields and we found a, a B-26 base, which is out of the 9th Air Force, and landed it there. And I coasted down to the end of the runway and then off, turned off, but I didn't get it quite all the way off. And when I shut the other two engines off uh, for safety's sake, anyway, they were giving me the devil for not pulling all the way off the runway. And I figured they'd be coming to me off. But anyway, they were taken off, and those B-26s have got lots of power anyway. So they just come down and took off downwind. They come down where I was parked. But anyway, when we got out of the airplane where the sucker was leaking gas out of those wings, I don't know what blew up down there, but something. So I was happy that I did shut it off right away because I, uh, one time, yeah, well anyway, we, I think that one, whatever time it was that we flew back on the transport and landed at Land's End, why it, uh, I think it was the, was this trip because I remember that I was concerned about my Christmas presents back in that footlocker. A lot of times if you get shot down where the other crews in there just kind of go through everything and take all the goodies that they want out. Yeah. But anyway, the, the operations guy was watching our, our materials so that they wouldn't be absconding with them. And, uh, uh, so, let's see, I forgot what I was going to even say about that. Oh, that I, uh, I waited for him to ship us by train back from this base that we were in landed in down at the end of England. And nobody wanted to do anything, so I had enough money with me, so I paid for the whole crew to get back. <laughs> on the train, and when I got back, well, they said I, they couldn't pay me any money because that was reverse Lend-Lease. Oh. I was really irritated about that. Oh, that, uh, So you ended up picking up the pick time. The train fare, I don't know how much it was, I can't remember <laughs> now. Uh, we, one time in the fall, we took off, as well, we still had real kennel, and blew a collector ring, which is kind of the manifold for the radial engine and uh, I blew it in such a way that the flames or the exhaust flames were coming over the top of the wing. And we were one of the first ones to take off. And so I asked them for permission to come back in and land. And they said, oh no, you have to wait till the rest of the group gets off. And they didn't want me messing up their runway uh, if something happened when I landed. No, it's not. And so they held me out there flying around with these flames coming back over that big old gas tank. And uh, normally when you come back off a mission, why well, you don't have too much fuel left and you don't have any bomb loads and everything's light. pretty light. But when you first take off, why well, you're loaded with gas and loaded with bombs and, and uh, you're really pretty heavy. You can't be dropping them over England. No, uh, they, uh, they also had a, well anyway, we, they waited till everybody took off before they let me, let me come back and land again. And That's been scorched pretty good. Yeah, it? you come in, normally you come in and stalled out about 85 to 90, you come in about 90 miles an hour. Uh, and this one I brought in about 120 because I knew it was heavy. And uh, I think we just got in position when that old girl stalled out. We were right at the end of the runway and was there. Yeah. And just, uh, she hadn't increased the speed, you just stalled her. Well, yeah, we probably would have got out, stopped maybe before we got there. I don't know. But, uh, but it's mostly just trying to use a little judgment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but they, uh, when you took off, uh, the bombs had pins. They had little impellers in the front of them. And when they would drop away, the impeller would spin off, and then the bomb would be armed. 
Well, they have a pin that goes through them with a tag on it when they're on the ground to keep that impeller from going out accidentally or however. And so that when you take off, uh, when you got out of away from England and over the channel, well, then the bombardier would go back and pull all those pins out. And uh, uh, then usually you carry high explosive like 500 pounders or 250 pounder bombs. Going to ask you what size bombs you're depending on what they were bombing, and then of course the humanitarian efforts of the Air Force they would uh, go and bomb, and then they would maybe go in with high explosives for two or three groups, and then they'd drop a load of incendiary so they could get a fire going and burn things up, and then they uh interspersed in all these things, they would have somebody drop time bombs, which had a chemical reaction and they wouldn't explode until the chemical ate through and that would get broken when it hit the ground. And, kind of a nasty trick. <laughs> yeah, and you never, if you come back with, that once you pulled the pin on time bombs, you never brought them back. And they had a spot up in the North Sea that you went and dropped them. Well, we were fortunate one time to go in and they did bomb and they had a recall and We'd already pulled the pin, so we had to go up to the North Sea in an area that they had designated and drop the bombs up there in the water. So, hmm. uh, the uh, one time we were out on a mission, and there was a the group down off to our left and below us were carrying incendiaries, and one of the ships got hit with flak and ignited the incendiary bombs, and that thing just took off like a rocket and went out on the head of us and and climbed up and went in a real steep climb and then fell off on one wing and and nobody got out of it. It just went on down and crashed. And of course the bombardiers and navigators, they sat up there in front, they could see everything there in that big bubble nose. Well anyway, my bombardier and another one, he was out of Kansas City and another one from Kansas, uh, were observing all this and they said, Boy, if we ever get anything like that, we're getting out of this airplane anything like that happened. And again, they wore harnesses and then had their chutes up there with them on the floor. Well, this other, uh, what was his name? can't remember his name now. And the other plane, and uh, they used to lead the low squadron. And they were flying in formation this day, and, and the plane behind them, underneath of them, came up and when you move the controls on a plane, you don't put the nose down and the tail comes up. He got too close, the plane below him, and saw he was and dumped his, or pushed the wheel forward and the nose, or the tail come up and hit underneath the plane and flipped it right up in front and wiped that plexiglass nose right off. And that's where the bombardier sat. He's sitting with his feet almost out in the nose. Well, anyway, the poor bombardier, he, they talked about this beforehand. And he uh, just reached over and got a shoot and it fell on out of the nose and he was gone. Well, there was, I think they had a feather one engine, one engine uh, that got the prop bent on it uh, when it hit and when they come together. But the plane came back, all the rest of the crew came back and he spent the rest of the war as a prisoner of war there. And uh, so it was uh, kind of ironic that he got out and he got out early. Huh. Too early. But. <coughs> It looked, uh, the plane came back, and we, I got some pictures of it, and without the plexiglass nose, it was bent up around the, where it hooked on and so on. But Some of that was a remarkable airplane as far as being able to... Yeah, they just bang it all up. Damage and, and yeah. yeah. Keep flying. Uh, one day we went, they uh, used to have, the Germans, when they would shoot flak at you, they would sometimes have just one gun shooting at, at a group at a time. Uh, and it would be controlled by stealth. And then they would have like a series of maybe four or five guns under one control. Uh, and, and they would trail you as you flew along where they would try to trail and get your altitude and shoot down. And then there was a couple of cities that had box barrages, which they knew you were going to come over their city uh, and uh, come in within a certain altitude and 
and you were going to go through, and they would put it like an imaginary box up there, and they would shoot inside that box. Well, I, I forget which, which uh, city it was now. It was over on the Rhine someplace. I can remember going. Anyway, you'd fly in, and you'd fly. Normally, your, your approach was so that when you went in and bombed, you could make a, a slight turn one way or the other, and then be headed back towards England when you made the, the turn. Well, anyway, you'd fly back down around this box barrage, and it would be just like a thunderhead up there, all full of smoke, and where they'd been shooting their groups ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And well, I went to that city twice and never got a hole. But you just kind of really put your cheeks together when you come up through there because you knew that you were going to get full holes. Yeah, and uh, you can, on flak, if you can see the orange puff in it when it explodes, then you're too close. And you see that once in a while. And then you can hear the shrapnel rattle off your airplane every once in a while, too. That means that they're too close. Uh, or is it just a puff of black smoke? Yeah. There? Yeah, you're pretty yeah. safe then, but when you start seeing the orange on the inside one. Uh, we also went in one time, this was later on, when we, after we'd been there for a long time, and uh, uh, he used, uh, they used shafts, they called it, and I think they still use it for uh, interfering with the radar signals. And uh, each plane would carry some, and they'd just kick it out the, out the waist of the airplane when you went in on your bomb run. Like aluminum pole. Yeah, it's yeah, just like uh, icicles on a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that covers, when you drop it, well, it doesn't cover you, but it covers the next group coming in behind you. Well, one day we got assigned the job three. I was, to me, it was the, like they pulled a high squadron out that I was leading. And uh, we didn't even carry any bombs. All we carried was just shafts. So we got to go in and lead the 8th Air Force in over the target. Mm -hmm. We were the only one going so we could protect the first group. And that was kind of eerie being out there because we're, we're like mules and cows that we're used to herding together. Mm -hmm. And if you're out there all by yourself going in, well, you get you're kind of exposed. Of, yeah, we flew in with the group part of the way and then we went on ahead and uh, increased it and got there about five minutes before they did. You mentioned Pathfinders. I read some books about uh, the uh, Royal Air Force and their uh, Lancaster bombers. And of course, they bombed at night. Yeah. And they use Pathfinders a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they bomb on a visual light. Yeah. In the areas or something. To, yeah. Uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, they uh, they just area bombed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But those. Uh, let's see, a B-17, I think, was originally designed about 1935, 36, and but then with modifications, we were flying them in the 40s, early 40s, and I don't know. So I was in, uh, it was either a Sterling or a Lancaster, anyway, one of them, and they were the crudest airplane. They I, yeah, they, I just went in and went through one one time at an English base. And I guess they all cut it up in Lancaster. Hauled a lot of weight, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, but, uh, I sure wouldn't want to. Uh, anyway, when you came back from a mission, uh, you got put your stuff all the way or parked your airplane, rode up the airplane if you had any problems with it, and talked to the crew chief and checked it over for damage, and, and then you'd get debriefed and on what you saw that day and what went on in your area. Uh, then you would head for the mess hall to get something to eat. Well, when you went in the mess hall, why they they would have a, a guy sitting at the table and they'd give you a shot of, they usually had bourbon or uh, uh, blended whiskey or rye, and uh, give you a shot of booze if you wanted it. And of course, I'm I'm almost, yeah, I'm 20 by then, so I'm getting up there, I'm getting old. <laughs> and, because uh, I was the colonel that came in in the middle of my group, always looked like such an old man because he was 
had pretty thin hair on top. He was about half bald. And I was talking to the a guy afterwards, many years after I got out of service, and about where he was. And they, he said he saw him once in a while in California. And I said, God, isn't he dead yet? And he said, no, because he was, like I was 20, he was only about 10 years older than I was, 12 years older, but he was in his early 30s. But <laughs> he was an old man, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, because our tail gunner was in his early 30s, and he was the old man of the crew. All of us, some were 19, 20, 21, 22. And this, uh, was it a waist gunner that got the 109? No, no it was the ball turret gun. Ball turret. Yeah. Now, did uh, he have uh, movies to confirm that deal? Or no. Or did some of the other no. crew confirm it? Or? Some of the other planes confirmed it. Other planes confirmed it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a busy trip, that, that one. That was the one that everything happened on, it seemed like. Yeah. All happened at once. Yeah. Well, anyway, when I uh, uh, I flew my last mission on the 31st of December, which is real close to New Year's Eve, when we got back. And so uh, we uh, come back and got in jawline and, and went by the table, and I so I had my out of booze, and I said uh, to him, I was kidding him, I said something about, I, went, I said, I didn't get back a couple times, I guess I should have, you know, that couple times we didn't get in here, I didn't need <laughs> a sample for that, so I sat down at the table next to him, and was sitting drinking, and, and a couple of them were like, hi, Fisher, you're all done, that's all your last mission, oh, you can have mine today, and <laughs> anyway, I was feeling quite good when I left the uh, mess hall, then I went back to the barracks and got cleaned up and then went down to the officers club and must have had more than my share and the, all of those things are all the like the officers club and the barracks are all dispersed and you have a path between them through the farmer's field to get where you're going well all right i woke up the next morning and lay in the bed and i've got full uniform on and you have kind of pink pants they call them pink mm-hmm. like anyway the knees were all mud and my hands were all mud, so I know my mode of locomotion <laughs> to get back to the to the barracks. You had a reason to celebrate, though. Yeah, we uh, five missions, huh? They uh, about halfway through your missions, why they send you what they call to the flak house, which is just kind of a rest and re- recreation, and they you go down and get on the train, and they send you over to the other side of England, and it was up uh, in uh, north of Liverpool. Black, black something, I forget what it's called. And so we were, I'd been sick, I had a cold, my ears were plugged up, and I was feeling terrible, and we were due to go, so uh, we uh, were scheduled out the next day to go, so we weren't flying that next day. And so I was ready for rest anyway. And what they do is you're laying in bed and a sergeant comes in through and he has a list and he has a flashlight and he'll come along and poke you and say, you know, it's time to get up, you're on, you're on today. And, and so this day I saw him come in the barracks and he come down to waking people up and he comes to me and he says, uh, all right, you're leading the high today. I said, no, I'm not. I go, no, I'm sorry, you, we have you listed as leading the high today. So I'm like, Ah, oh, what can I catch? Well, anyway, I looked for the guy that made up formations all, all morning. Never could find that bugger. And he had run out of people. He didn't have anybody to lead high, so he put us up there again. So anyway, we take off, and I'm still grumbling. And we get out, and just about to get into formation when they had a recall, and they have a code word for it. And the recall comes through, and so guess who was the first one back at the base. <laughs> we plotted a course and come down at about 1,000 feet a minute, I think, because we were up about 12,000 feet by then. And uh, anyway, we were the first ones back, and, and we even got a ride in a B-17 up to the flak house. There's somebody, and I never, uh, Jacobson was the guy that made up the formation that day, and I didn't ever catch him until about three weeks later, I think, before I got a hold of him. 
said, I'm sorry, but I didn't have anybody else to leave the high that day. But anyway, it was recalled. But they, uh, they had a real easy way of getting your air pressure back on the inner ear, which is what your problem is, and you fly it. 25,000 feet, I think it's about a quarter of the pressure that is at, uh, at sea level as far as the weight of the air. And so you had trouble with your ears a lot of times, especially if you had a little cold to get that air back on your inner ear. The planes weren't pressurized no, at all. No, no. Uh, and so we had a flight surgeon, and we used, his name was Huff, Doc Huff. And we used to kid him every, all the time because he would, uh, you just go up when you had a problem. Well, you'd go to him and say, "Doc, I need a blowjob," because <laughs> he had a. He'd take a syringe, like an ear syringe, and give you a mouthful of water, and he'd say, "Okay, on the count of three, swallow." And of course, you'd swallow that would plug your throat up, and he'd plug up the other nostril, and he'd squeeze that syringe, and that air would go up through, and then up through that inner tube down. Oh, feel like the side of your head is going <laughs> to blow off, but it would feel a lot better when it got through. We're going. Uh -huh. Flew the last mission on December 31st, 1944. Uh, Pups around the base for about a couple weeks, and then hopped the transport. Uh, flew back to Iceland uh, on a commercial plane that was chartered to the Air Force, uh, Constellation. Uh, took about 20 hours to come back. That's it. Took me 21 hours, 21 days to go over. Uh, got into New York City and uh, landed at LaGuardia. Uh, remember, I had hadn't gotten paid for a while, or had some money coming anyway. But anyway, I sat and had a few drinks with another gentleman that I don't just met coming back, and and we rehashed the war and and had a few drinks, and all of a sudden I don't have any money left. I have my train ticket to Chicago, to Fort Sheridan, where I was to get the leave papers. And so I, anyway, he, I didn't have a checking account, I had a savings account. So he cashed a, a check for me, uh, a bench check that we got someplace, uh, for $10. And so I think I bought one more round of drinks. Anyway, I ended up uh, taking a taxi cab from one station that we were at, from New York Central to Penn Station, or vice versa, I don't remember which. And it was getting nighttime, and it was getting almost time to get on the train. And so I hopped on a cab, run over there, and grabbed my billfold, and, and like it was 50, 80 cents or something like that. Gave him the bill, got on the train, woke up the next morning, and I'd give him the $5 bill instead of the one. So I had $1 to eat on, on the train from New York to Chicago. Well, anyway, some people on the train helped me out and bought some food. And, uh, but, uh, got into Michigan and, uh, came from Chicago to the Muskegon on the train and then caught my father's bus line up to Hesperia and was, happy to get home. I know he heard me come up. Yeah, I didn't tell him that I was coming right which day because I didn't know what day I was going to get out of my, uh, out of Chicago. And so I had a good time. I remember he had a, a 42 Chevrolet, a brand new one that he had babied all during the war in this couple of years. And I uh, got, he put some gas in it and I picked up a gal and went to Grand Rapids and, and went into a restaurant to eat and come out and I'd locked the keys to the car. <laughs> so I had to pry open his little wing window and mess the mechanism on that. Mess the mechanism on that. I don't think he ever forgave me for that <laughs> <laughs> car that he had babied all during the war. Uh, after I got back, they had an excess of piles. They really didn't know what to do with you. I went to Miami Beach again for a uh, semi-vacation. I guess I was down there for a short period of time. Then I transferred up to Columbus, Ohio. Um, then I went, I was there for a couple of months. Went to Romulus outside of Detroit, where the Detroit airport is now. 
was there for a little while, and then went back down to Homestead, Florida, for a couple weeks, uh, and then back again to Detroit, and then went to New Hampshire, got transferred out there, and I had a, I had bought a Chevrolet car, a coupe, that had about 100,000 on it, and, and I'm driving it all these places that I'm going, because they authorize your private transportation when you got a commission. Got promoted to first lieutenant while I was in England too, by the way, and uh, went to New Hampshire and stayed in a hotel because I got in late to New Hampshire and went out to base the next day and they wanted two guys to transfer to California and another guy that lives in the state of Washington said he'd go and Mary and was living in California then with her husband and so I said, well, I'd transfer too. So he drove his car and I drove mine and I remember it was the 4th of July and I think I drove from New Hampshire to Michigan in one day uh, back on the two lane road and uh, then I stayed home for about a week. I think father put a new motor in the car so I could make it to California with the car. Um, drove to California and was stationed in Sacramento and then uh, transferred to Travis, I think they call it now. At the time it was Fairfield Air Force Base and it was built uh, originally as a, as a hospital base so when they invaded Japan they would have lots of places to bring the wounded back and it was uh, built in a funnel where there was a break in the mountain so that the wind went through there, uh, which uh, this Fairfield is up north of San Francisco a little way. So they, if they come back flying from overseas where they wouldn't be fogged in, uh, was stationed there and got put into a, a C-54 Air Transport Command uh, with, with a group or with a, and a crew on that one with the crew chief and a a pilot and a co-pilot and a navigator and so I was there for a few days and got on the plane and flew to Hawaii uh, and then we kept going I can't remember the exact route we flew into Kwajalein and then into Guam and then into Okinawa and we sat around there and living in the airplane uh, just sleep on the airplanes on the bucket seats. Uh, and uh, anyway, for I don't know how long we were there, about a week or so or a couple weeks. Anyway, while well, they were getting ready to sign the peace treaty with the Japanese. And uh, then we flew into Japan and when we, the first day in the Japan, the Japanese still had their rifles and guns at the base and we flew into Atsugi. Uh, it was funny because Jim was stationed there when he was in Japan, so it gets to be a small world. But, uh, so we would just fly in, drop sea rations off, and then uh, uh, we did that a couple times. Then the latter part of the way we were bringing American prisoners of war back out, which was a very interesting group to talk to because they had been in prison camp zone for three or four years. And uh, so it was that. And did that, I can't even remember how long it was there uh, less than a month though flying in and out back and forth to Japan and then uh, got orders to come back and so we left uh, a bunch of airplanes there and then flew the C-54 into Guam and I remember coming across north of the Philippines from Okinawa ran into the edge of a typhoon and it took two of us to manually fly that four engine transport plane. It was really rough out there. We have an attitude of the nose down probably 20 degrees and gaining about 500 feet to 1,000 feet a minute. Just, just really getting rattled around. We had air crews in the back you know, which just had seats along on the side, just bucket seats. And, and I think all of them got sick back there, but you were so busy in the front you didn't have a chance to get sick. And flew the route got back to California, uh, had a whole bunch of points, so I decided to get out and hop to my little Chevrolet <coughs> and drove back.
fact that he tried, got discharged, come home, and that would have been like in October of 45, uh, come home and bummed around for a while, and, and I think father took off that winter and went to Florida and left me with his business to run. Said he'd had enough of it and wanted to disappear for a while, which he did. And all I remember is making out a whole bunch of checks one time, and including it must have been in the spring, because I paid his income tax and a whole bunch of bills and forgot to sign any of the checks. No. Of all the mail, forgot to sign. It. <laughs> uh, don't remember what the result was. I'm not too happy about that. Either. No. <laughs> got it, well, got most of them back to home. They just ran right on through and. And cashed anyway. Uh, then I uh, went to uh, Grand Rapids Junior College and uh, spent a year over there. Uh, then come back, and it was in the summertime uh, that my father and another one of the guys that drove for him decided to buy the Wolf Lake Transit Company, which ran from Wolf Lake into Muskegon. About 12 times a day and I had a couple of routes and so on. Anyway, uh, when it come time to do it, why, to buy, the, back, sign the final papers and everything, the other guy backed out, didn't want to do it, so I took what money I'd saved and then put in with my dad and and bought the bus line and moved down there and, and uh, uh, ran that and then paid him off with the monies that I made from it. Uh, and met Betty Flickema, who lived at Wolf Lake, married her, had three children, one right after the other. Um, then ran that for about 23 years, I think. And it was the wrong type of business to get into, uh, mainly from the fact that people didn't want to ride buses. They rode them during the war, and they were tired of riding buses and didn't want to. And as they got cars, uh, the business went down. Uh, the downtown Muskegon was starting to dissipate. Uh, everything was downtown, so people were it was good for a bus line because they'd ride down there and do their shopping and then ride back home again or go to work to Continental. That was slowing down. Lakey's was down there. Uh, a lot of people going into the downtown. They used to have traffic jams down there in the afternoon when it would let out at 3.30. Uh, anyway, uh, the Betty's had a friend that she went to school with, a girl, and she was, he was married to a man by the name of Vern Hovey, who uh, was in the Seabees during the war, and came out, went to school, graduated with an engineering degree, and uh, went to when he graduated with that, he went to Cleveland and worked for Fred Harvey. They had the Cleveland Union Terminal. And then he eventually went to Death Valley and then transferred to Grand Canyon. And he knew that the guy that was running transportation there, had been there for like 45 years, was going to retire. So he told me about it. And I went into Chicago and uh, for an interview and applied for the job. And then about a year later, where they called me to, because the guy was wanted to retire, but he didn't want to retire, and finally they told him he had to. And so I, Betty and I flew out to Grand Canyon and went uh, on the spot interview and and was hired and and uh, moved. I moved out there in April of '69. Then we come back and moved the furniture and and because Marie was still in high school, she was a senior. And uh, then moved to Kelp or to uh, Grand Canyon, and I started out as transportation manager, which meant tour buses and garages and mules and uh, filling stations, and which all I had a little background in all of it except mules. I didn't know anything <laughs> about the mules. But they had a good a good mule manager that knew what he was doing. So. Uh, gradually progressed up to, I was transportation manager for quite a while, and then went up to uh, president manager, and then uh, vice president of 
of administration and then senior vice president. And then retired from there in 1993, I think it was, after 25 years. Uh, meanwhile, I had divorced Betty after about 35 years, and a year later I married Sandy Himmelberger, and a couple years later than that, and I think Loretta was born, and then Andy. So and they're 13 and 12 now. Uh, after I retired in 93, I think it was about 95, why Sandy and I were divorced. Uh, I'm now living in Flagstaff uh, with Betty Peck, and I have been driving school bus for Flagstaff Public School for about four years now, mm -hmm. uh, about four hours a day, and you have summers off, and you don't make much money, but I have lots of entertainment. Mm -hmm. so, um, that is about the story of my life right up till now. Thank you very much, John. That certainly is interesting. We'll make a copy of this and we'll make sure you get a couple copies. Okay. Well, I think if you just send me one one, I can get that. Okay. Well, that's great. Compress. 48 years yeah. into one. <laughs> yeah, one <laughs> about hour and a half tape. Huh? Well, about three minutes. That's the last part of it. Oh yeah, your uh, your post military. Yeah, well that's not really as much fun, you know. But I'm glad you added that though, because yeah. uh, some of them I've done. Uh, Everything but that. Just has to be a circular car. Yeah. See the socket right there? Okay.